Good morning, Conwingo. So totally disregard the bulletin this morning. We had an unexpected baptism, and we've been holding this song from the choir until the next baptism, so it's on today. Come on, kid. Christ to be baptized. 
And there are two senses of what baptism is and what's a picture of. Uh, most importantly, it is identifying with Jesus himself and what he did. So in other words, when you see the person come down here and you see them go underneath the water, they are taking their body and they are identifying, as the scripture says, they are identifying with Jesus that Jesus went to the cross, he took our sins, and then he went to the grave. He took our sins to the grave with him. So we're taking our body and we're saying, I am buried with Christ. My sins are buried with him. It's dead. It's gone. It's done. The life I used to live, that old life is done. Buried. And then we come out of that water. Because Jesus came out of that grave. And because Jesus came out of his grave, we are identifying with our Lord and we're saying, okay... Jesus was resurrected, and so I know that just as certain as my sin is dead and buried, my body, my life, my soul is going to be resurrected one day as well. And so we are identifying, saying, I was, I'm was, i dead with Christ just as he died, but I'm alive with him as well. And that's what we're doing with our body today. So what I like to say, it's a physical representation or symbol. It's a physical symbol of a spiritual truth. Inside the person's soul who steps into the water today, they have already placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They are born again. They are saved already. And so the other idea or symbolism that we know from the Scriptures because of John's baptism that came first, John the Baptist was baptizing people and it was for repentance. And so that idea is like we are showing like the idea that we're getting into this water. We're saying, okay, I have repented of my old life and I'm ready to live a new life for Jesus Christ. But keep in mind, the water does not change anything. Amen. This water doesn't change anything. So this morning we have a... a, a very special baptism in my sight because uh, her name is Ashley and I'll let her come down and I'll, and I'll let her uh, share what's on her heart but we were blessed as a church to have a, a young man named Jackson and his family come into Iwana and when he came into Iwana he was uh, a little bit rambunctious <laughs> But myself, the other leaders, and uh, in particular, Ron Nelson, we began praying for Jackson and his family and everybody who would be involved in Jackson's life. And as we prayed, we were asking God to specifically to allow that family to come into here. We began praying those years ago. And so now today we have Ashley that's going to be here. She, amen. I share that because it did not happen overnight, but in God's timing, she came forward, she wanted to join the church, she wanted to be baptized. And so we went to her house and, and opened the scriptures and, and sat down with her with the Word of God. And as she read the Word of God, and sometimes, like I told her, sometimes I feel right then we need to pray and, and like this is happening right now. Other times I say, no, God, you're going to do your work. And that's what I said. If she had a Bible, I told her the chapter, I said, you just read it. You read it, and then whenever God speaks to you, you let me know. And so the next day, she said, I'm getting baptized. She placed her faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, and the Word, as it always is, was enough. The Word was more than enough. So today we have Ashley. Ashley, come on down into the water.
and they asked me one night, could I come with them? And I said, yeah. And I came on the night of Awana, visited, and I sat over there, and I felt my grandmother touch me, and it felt like this is where I belong. And I'm doing this for her and for my children. And I'm glad to have faith again. And sorry I brought that anxiety so much. <laughs> Jason and Jess have stepped in and they uh, just surrounding themselves with the kids. And you can see how much they love the children over there. And uh, the kids crawling up around, they want to see, they want to get all up in it. Love it. Love it. I was going to share, and I, I told her, I said, if, if you don't have anything that's on your mind or your heart, I said, I want to share. I want the church to know you told God you weren't coming back. But God wasn't willing to listen to her and to leave it at that. He said, no, you're going to come back and he's going to, he was going to use his love to draw her back in. And so she said, well, that's what I wanted to share. And I said, good. Because all I know is the church needs to hear that. That even if we've said in our heart, never again to church, never again to the Lord, never again to God. God loves us too much to leave us. Practice is uh, Sunday evening, 6 p.m., all boys and girls, ages 5 uh, to uh, grade 12 are invited. Uh, if you have any questions about the uh, the Christmas play, see Amy and see uh, Amber. <coughs> the, the play is uh, the 22nd, that's a Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Um, there's a couple uh, meetings coming up for trustees, uh, the November the 12th at 7 uh, I want to skip this one for a second. Ladies Prayer Breakfast is also planned for November 17th at uh, 8.30. And Men's Prayer Breakfast, same morning, just uh, in the Fellowship Hall as well. Uh, and Business Meeting next Sunday, uh, the 17th at 6 p.m. And please bring some goodies for us to eat afterwards, because we're always hungry afterwards. Uh, Joe, uh, would you like to come up and give a little spiel? <laughs> well, it's not very long. It fits on a sticky note. <laughs> Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> um, I'm Joe. I'm in the youth group. And um, the youth group is putting on a Lion King movie night on November 15th at 6. And we think it's going to go to around 9, but we don't know because we're Baptists and we like to talk. Anyway. Um, so to get in, it's just sort of donation-based. We're just trying to... Um, just 
get some fun so that we can keep going on events like we did recently. Which, what was it called? Epic. We went on Epic for free and it was really cool and it was awesome and that was all donation based and a lot of us wouldn't have been able to go without y'all's help. And so that was fantastic. Um, but at this movie night, we're going to be having um, popcorn and soda and we're going to have some candy that you can purchase. It's going to be really cheap. Um, and there's a raffle that you can enter. We're going to have like a box. It's going to be like a movie night at home kind of thing. It should be a really good time and we're really excited. And we want you guys to all bring your families out and just have a really good time all together and really good fellowship um, on Jesus' name. And we're really excited. And we hope that you can all come out. Thank you. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, you guys have blown it away this year. Uh, we have um, how many? Two hundred. We have we have we have taken. Y'all have taken two hundred boxes. That is. And above that, uh, the, also with that, the youth put together 51 boxes um, on Thursday. The, uh, the only thing is that we still need to cover the shipping charge for that. Uh, $200 were, di were already donated to ship those boxes out, but we're still $240 short. So if you feel led to, to give to Operation Christmas Child, um, and you just don't have the time to put together a box, um, or... Uh, you just don't. You just don't know. You're kind of scared of putting together a box. Donate a little bit of money to to the youth group, um, just to be able to you know ship these boxes out because uh, they're packed, ready to rock and roll. We just need nine dollars a box to get them to where they're going. Um, Keith, is Keith up there? Oh, hey, hey Lisa. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Could you scroll down to the Operation Christmas Child video for me, please? That'd be awesome. Um, and we just have a quick two-minute video of the impact that a single shoebox has. Um, My name is Joanne, and I grew up in one life. of the smallest islands in the thousands of islands of the Philippines. I grew up in an area close to a dump site. I remember my dad losing his job. I often watched my younger siblings and skip school so my mom could go to the dump site and look for things that she can sell to buy us food. I remember my dad built, um, he built a house, we call it a house, because that's a house that we live. It's made of cardboard. Because of our situation, I've never received a gift as a kid. They cannot even afford to buy food for us, let alone gifts for birthdays and Christmas. So my sister started um, going to this church nearby. I remember I went after her one time, and the pastor in that church invited me to come help them. I happened to help out the people handed out shoebox to the kids in the neighborhood, including my sister. Every time I hand shoebox to the kids, there's a glimpse in my heart that I hope I can get one too. Little did I know, towards the end, a lady came up to me and gave me the extra shoebox. I just felt so loved. Everything on the shoebox were very special to me. So it was the first gift I've ever received, and it was around Christmas and seeing new items, like notebooks and pencils. It was amazing. Now my life is different. I am forever grateful and blessed to be able to pack a shoebox with my husband and my girls. The feeling of giving back and knowing that this box represents a face of a child Thank you for packing your shoes. So your shoe boxes are due back next week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even if you haven't thought about it, just remember that 
your shoebox is, is literally changing a lot. Like, as, as much as we'd like to, uh, you know, belittle it or, you know, just not even think about it, when we pack a shoebox, it's changing a life uh, for Jesus. Um, and then I was told to ask Ms. Betty Sue, um, Ms. Betty Sue, about grief share, getting through the holidays. Would you like to... Uh, <laughs> We're just getting through them. So, <laughs> um, I, that's all I got, man. That's. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, and then, if I could have the ushers come up for uh, for offering, and we'll pray over the offering and open, uh, continue our service to the Lord. I'm sorry, man. This uh, this video is getting. <laughs> So uh, they come back, uh, the boxes come back next week, and then we're going to have a time of prayer over, over the boxes as well. Um, so just hang around, I, yeah, next week. So hang around next week, we're going to gather around the boxes and pray for those children, uh, for each, each one of those. So let's, uh, let's pray over the offering this morning, let's pray together. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and thank you so much, Lord, for how you bless us in our lives. Lord, you just bless us and give you Lord. Lord, we just thank you so much. Lord, I pray, Lord, that this, this next hour, Lord, we just forget everything, Lord, and just totally concentrate, Lord, and we know that. Bless these tithes and offerings, and we glorify your kingdom, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Amen.
sing a more awesome Savior, Jesus. Again, we thank you, veterans and active serving military, for your sacrifice and for your protection, the sacrifice from your families, your friends, uh, the comforts that this country gives. But also, we know who gave the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Sing it one more time. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name.
like for you to turn in your Bibles to the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, we begin here with the uh, first verse. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom carried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold the bridegroom coming. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But you go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins. And they said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And join me as we go to the Lord. In the Our Father, as we come to you today, we thank you and praise you for the stirring of the baptismal waters. And we thank you for Ashley's commitment to you faith in you and repentance before you and then to follow you in the waters of baptism. <coughs> we all can relate to that experience that are saved. We can all relate to the fact that that faith in you and the following baptism was the beginning of our journey of faith with you. And we thank you, Lord, for how that you have sustained us in that journey. We certainly have not sustained ourselves, but it's only by your strength and your power and your guidance that we are where we are in our faith today. <coughs> I pray, O oh God, that as we look at this parable that your Son used to demonstrate, as he did other parables, related to the kingdom of heaven. Here today we stand in quite a different culture than that culture. And so that as we seek to understand, our, we must go back to understand what it is about. 
So give us, dear Lord, your leadership, the Holy Spirit's leadership. I pray as we examine it that if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, as your Holy Spirit tugs upon their heart, that they will rejoice to come forward and receive your precious Son as their Savior and Lord. And that as they come forth, that those of us who have been saved and called according to your Spirit will rejoice <coughs> and be glad to see what you're able to do with the very worst of us and the very merciless of us when you transform us. For if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. And old things have passed away and all things have become new. We pray for your anointing upon your messenger, your anointing upon those who have come to listen. So in this moment, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, baby. Seated. Certainly the background for this message is found in the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And Jesus is teaching in relationship to the signs of the end and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I want us to look at the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel for a moment so that we can relate ourselves in relationship to this parable indeed to that chapter. In Matthew chapter 24, 36, you see the fact that our Lord is referring to His coming. To which He says, And no knoweth no man in relationship to the hour of our Lord's coming. And if you look at verse 39, you, you will see also that it says, And knew not until the flood came, referring to the days of Noah, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I refer you to verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. I refer you to verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. It amazes me that in the last decade there have been person after person, scholar after scholar that have tried to give a timeline when the Son of Man is going to come again and receive His church unto Himself. And yet in the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, it says over four or five times, you will not know the hour in which the Son of Man shall come. Amen. 
And yet we kind of toy with that, and we're going to demonstrate how we toy with that as believers in Jesus Christ. Now what about these ten virgins? Five of them are wise, and five of them are what? Foolish. It does not say that five of them are good, and five of them are bad. It says that they were wise, <clears throat> excuse me, and they were also foolish. Many scholars have dealt with this passage, and yet related to the content of this paragraph concerning them, the virgins, we can only conclude from the text that this is referring to those who are saved and those who are not saved. And so I would submit to you that the midnight cry was somewhat expected because in the first verse, the scripture indicates in verse uh, chapter 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, and they all took their lamps, and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. And so there is some kinds of expectation in relationship to the fact of the coming of the bridegroom. But if you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 44 to 46, it says, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think that the Son of Man comes. And then it asks a question. And the question is, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. And then verse 46, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he comes shall find in so doing. Otherwise, when Jesus Christ comes again, will His servants be found faithful unto Him? And that's what this parable is about. There are five of them that have their lamps and they have their oil. There are five of them that have their lamps, but they do not have their oil. And oil is, in the Scriptures, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, it talks about a person named Simon. And it says that Simon believed and that he followed through with baptism. But as he looked, he realized that there was something that he did not have. Because people were being healed and people were being changed as the preachers James and John and then Philip in Samaria preached and Simon looked out and he kind of looked at it and he said hey what's different between them and me I have believed I have been baptized but I do not have that power 
And he realized that it was the power of the Holy Spirit. Now are you listening to me? And Simon said to the preachers, Hey, let, let me purchase this Holy Spirit. Let me buy this power. And he found out that the Holy Spirit's power and blessing is not to be purchased and it is not to be borrowed. And in this parable, we have the five that realize the power and the emphasis of the Holy Spirit and five of them that apparently do not sense the Holy Spirit. Largely in the church today, the preaching concerning the Holy Spirit of God is absent. We talk about salvation and praise God for those who are saved. We talk about baptism and praise God for those who are baptized. But there is a power that is absent from the church of Jesus Christ today. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so here these virgins are. They have their lamps and they are all going out to meet the bridegroom. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the scripture says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The midnight cry. <coughs> they were expecting it because they were there in relationship to a wedding. But the midnight cry did not come at first. Though they had their lamps and though they went out to meet the bridegroom, there was a delay. A delay. The Jewish custom of marriage was an engagement period and then a betrothal period and then the wedding. And the betrothal period from the time that they were serious about their relationship was one year. One year. And when it transpired that the bridegroom came and took the bride and the marriage was consumed, There were seven days. Seven days. But there was a delay. And I want us to look at that scripture, Matthew 24, 47 and 48. We've been talking about the servant, and now, verily I say to you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But watch this. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart my Lord delayeth his coming and then begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken 
The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. Did you hear the word delay? And then you look at Matthew 25, 5. While the bridegroom, referring to Jesus, while the bridegroom tarried, they all did something. What did they do? They slumbered and slept. The bridegroom delayed. This morning in the Sunday school lesson from Habakkuk, the central question was, how long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? How long what? How long will you continue to put up with this evil, this strife? How long will you not, you know, how long are you going to be tolerant in relationship to it? God was acting. Habakkuk just didn't know it. And I want to tell you today as we await the second coming of Jesus Christ that God is moving everything into place and Jesus is coming again. Amen. And we must understand, and we'll get to it quickly, what this delay is all about. Why, when we're saved and baptized, doesn't the Lord just rapture us right then? In 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 9. Listen carefully to this. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As some men count slackness, but He is what? Long suffering. You don't know what long suffering means? There it is. Long suffering. One of the main points in our lesson this morning was that God, in God's authority that He has authority over injustice and He has authority over evil and He has authority over our difficulties. The virgins slumbered and slept. Did you notice it said slumbered and slept? You know why that slumbered is? <clears throat> Have you ever kind of fallen into a chair and uh, all of a sudden you, uh, you're in twilight zone <laughs> and if somebody were to come and say, Jimmy! <laughs> He just woke up. <laughs> but if you were sound asleep, like the pastor is sometimes, <laughs> you, you do very careful to touch him. Some people are hard to wake up. And some just wake up. I'm one of those that you... Uh, one of those that's in the category of slap. Daisy can get up and do something, I have no idea what she's doing. The mother can kind of fall down and she runs in there and she's doing all of this, you know. I'm just sleeping away. And then she'll tell me, she said, I almost woke you up. Almost woke you up. 
Well, well, here we have it. He's long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should what? Perish, but that all should come to an everlasting life. And aren't we glad that our Lord is long-suffering with us? Amen. But then, in verse 15 to 18, and the count that the long-suffering, are you watching this? The long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom that was given unto him, hath written unto you. You, therefore, are as also in all of his epistles. Speaking in them of these things of which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures. And in verse 17, you therefore, beloved, Seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, watch this, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own what? Steadfastness. <clears throat> the reason our Lord is long suffering is to give those of us who are saved an opportunity for being sanctified. For being what? For, for growing in the Lord. The 18th verse says this. After it said all of that. But grow. What's that mean? Stay the same that you are? What's it mean? It means there's a transformation. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I ask you the question. Are you growing in your knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there a difference in how you're living your life today than when you le were living it, living it last week? Or have you gotten drowsy and fallen asleep? The Scripture challenges us when it says, Awake thou that sleepest. <coughs> Now, Paul wasn't talking to the evil. He wasn't talking to the unsaved. He was talking to those who knew Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. When he said, Awake thou that sleepest. The midnight cry. The midnight cry. Was an awakening cry. It was expected. It was delayed. And it was an awakening cry. And if we look there, Matthew 25 and 6, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and go you out to meet him. Ever heard this song? When Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children, the dead shall rise to meet Him in the air. And then those that remain shall be quickly changed at the midnight cry. Oh, at the midnight cry. 
<coughs> the midnight cry was an awakening cry. They had been slumbering and sleeping and they awakened. And the scripture says they awakened and they arose and those who were wise realized that they had oil and all of them trimmed their wicks. But the foolish ones, the wicks and the lanterns would only burn for a while. The wise theirs would burn as long as the oil lasted. You and I as believers need to understand that two things that we can do in relationship to the Holy Spirit and one is to indeed quench the movement of the Holy Spirit within us. Quench means like this. You've got a flame and you slowly close your fingers until the flame is out. A lot of believers have indeed quenched the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now what happens? They awaken to realize that some had made preparation and some had not made the proper preparation. They awaken to realize that judgment had arrived. Now notice this. The wise had oil. What about the foolish? They didn't have any oil. The wise gained entrance into the marriage. What happened to the foolish? The door was shut. One of these days, my dear friend, the day of grace and the day of the open door is going to be over. And the doors are going to be shut. Just like when Noah preached, the preacher of righteousness preached and preached that a flood was coming, a flood was coming, a flood was coming, and he continued to build the ark for the saving of his family. And then when everything was ready, the door was shut. And the scripture says, Jesus said, I have power to open and to what? <clears throat> shut. I want to tell you that the day is coming that the door is going to be shut. Then what's going to happen? To the wise he will say, Enter! And to the foolish, he will say, I don't know. That's going to be tragic. It's going to be sorrow for those who have not repented of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. To the wise, they will be in the marriage. The foolish will be what? Shut out. Shut out. Time is running out. Does your life show that you're on watch and alert for his coming? I'm going to read 
for you from the book of Romans. And uh, I want you to listen to this very carefully. Romans 13, verse 11. And that no. Do you remember a while ago? Do you remember a while ago it says, no man knows, no man knows, no man knows, no man knows. What was he talking about? About the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. And that. Now this is something we do know. We do know. And knowing that, and that knowing the time, you said, well, I didn't think we were going to know the time. Well, just hang in there. That now, it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, is our salvation nearer than the day when we believe? We know that he's not talking to the lost, he's talking to the saved. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. To convict of righteousness. To point man to the cross. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to judge. And the indwelling Holy Spirit why is it important for us to preach and teach about the indwelling Holy Spirit? Because when the Holy Spirit indwells us, it transforms our life. From the inside what? Out. And when it transforms our life, there, there, there is a fruit of the Spirit. There's the gentleness. That's a kindness. It's a mercy that Galatians 5 talks about. And I would ask you to look at that passage in Galatians 5. I believe it's verse 22 thereabout. And it says that the fruit of the Spirit is this that we should use that to determine whether we are awake or whether we are asleep. Use it as a checklist. As I am to use it as a checklist. Am I awake? Or have I fallen asleep at the switch? Churches should be running to capacity, and even now the surveys are showing that people are not attending church like they used to. But attending church is not the oil. It's the Holy Spirit that's the oil. It's the Holy Spirit that anoints, it's the Holy Spirit that heals, it's the Holy Spirit that lubricates, it's the Holy Spirit that cleanses, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us guidance, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us understanding in the Scriptures. Yes. 
And the Holy Spirit points men to Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit points men to Jesus. So does your life show that you're on watch and alert for his coming? The scripture over and over and over says, those who love his appearing, those who... Do you love his appearing? I ask you again, do you love his appearing? Yes. yes. Then if you do, it will be demonstrated in your life and your character. And it will be the fact that you give the Holy Spirit full reign in your life. Not only is time running out, but Jesus is coming again. Real soon. Are you ready? That's the question of the virgins getting ready for the wedding. Are you ready? If not, you can and you should be. Now here's the wedding that we're talking about. And I want to share from Revelation the chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 9. Whoa. Let us be what? Glad and do what? Rejoice and give honor to Him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and His wife, the church, the bride of Christ has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. When the marriage supper of the Lamb is cast, will our Lord say, enter, or will He say, I don't know. The battle is required. Our Father, We have Jesus Christ in our lives and hearts, many of us. But we are quenching the Holy Spirit, not allowing Him to have full effectiveness in our lives. And I pray for all of us, and I pray for myself, that we will be watchful and alert, love the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we will have that desire to let the Holy Spirit burn brightly in us and through us to His honor, to your honor, and to your glory. Someone may be here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. They do not have Jesus Christ in their lives. They do not have the Holy Spirit in their heart and life. They can. They can. And you invite them. The end of Revelation says, and the Spirit says come the bride the church says come and those who hear and respond say come as well so I pray there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ the first Lord and Savior that they will respond to your Holy Spirit 
I pray also that those who do know you as personal Lord and Savior will examine their hearts and lives as I examine my heart and lives. And that we will have a desire to give the Holy Spirit full reign in our lives. And that we will indeed bear the fruit that He's willing to bear in us. And this, I will be different, we will be different, and the church will be different. Way on us, O oh Lord, and give us the strength to respond to your call. God's people said. Would you stand with us in the invitation? Ask you to come stand here. I can be here. Let me see here. Come now. Don't tear it. Don't delay.
invitation is still open for us. Press is you. Decision you need to make.
stand up right now. Um, we'll, just, we'll have a prayer. We'll, we'll, we'll have a prayer to close the service, and then we're going to sing. And then after we sing, in case we'll join hands, we'll sing, and then we'll come forward. And, I, and then you welcome Chris, or you hug her, you tell her, you tell her what the Lord has in your heart. I'm going to pray for you. I'm here for you. This is your new church family. We're here for you. <laughs> There's a lot of us. There are. No, we're, we are. We are here for you. We're here for your family. Dr. Carter, he's one of the pastors here. I'm one of the pastors here. Pastor Rusty, he's another pastor here. Where are my deacons at? Raise your hand here. Where are my deacons at? Where are my deacons at? Where are my deacons at? We are here for you. We're here to serve you. We're here to love you. To help you with your walk in Christ. Dr. Carter didn't know this. And I didn't talk to him about it. Next week, I'm starting a series from the book of Acts on the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And there is no better way to, as a precursor to show the Spirit is still saving lives. Amen. So let's join hands together. I'm going to have a prayer and then we'll sing together. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice today as we join hands together, unified together as your family. We rejoice today that today is the day of Crystal's salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are powerful. You are mighty to save. You are our rock. And where we might say, how long, Lord, how long? If you came yesterday, Crystal wouldn't be born again today. Thank you for waiting, God. Thank you for those who knew they were supposed to come. They didn't come. Thank you that right now, I know you're convicting their hearts and saying, why did I go up like she did? As Dr. Carter preached, the Spirit says, come on. The church says, come. We want everyone that you're speaking to and drawing in, we want everyone to receive this forgiveness and this salvation. We praise you for the work you did today, God. We give this coming song to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together as we close the service. All right. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. I could praise about this church, okay? We asked for and needed $240, right? Yes. Yeah. Mary, how much did we get? Today, $580. And then so $200 Woo! last week, that makes that $800 for the Operation Christmas Tree. Woo! Now with that extra money, we could go out and get more shoe boxes. We could. But... With the shoe boxes that we have, we can fill the ones from the youth, all 52 of them, or 51, whatever, with the discipleship package. And it comes out to, what, 700 and... It was like $15. Yeah, it was $15 extra that we had. So because of this church's generosity, every shoe box that the youth send out, those kids will be discipled. Wow. So 